Sometimes it's not enough to be reminded that Jesus hasn't left you or forgotten you. We need to declare it over ourselves, over others. No matter the season you may find yourself in, no matter the depths of darkness you're wading through, you can join him in declaring the truth that God is light upon your feet, whether or not you can see the next step, that God is your strength even though the weight of life seems to be crushing you down, and that when your job, your marriage, your relationship, your health feels like it's coming to a dead end, there is only one God that can make dead things live again. These are his promises, and they're the only thing you need to declare over your life. So as you step into this next season or this next moment, you can declare that God's not done with you. He's just getting started. You can declare that the good work that he has started in you, he will surely complete it. You can declare that the same God that parted the seas goes before you, goes behind you. You can declare these promises over your life, over your family's life, over the people passing on the street. You can declare these truths over every circumstance, over every season of your life. You can declare that every day belongs to him and every new breath belongs to him. Because we have the power of a living God living inside of us. And this is our declaration. Today, and we won't be quiet. 
We shout out your parades. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your parades. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your parades. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely.
This new year, we cry out to you, the one who restores broken hearts, who refreshes tired spirits, who makes all things new. Let our faith and hope be born again today. Help us to let go of the past, stop looking back and Turn our eyes toward you. We are here today in full acceptance of who we've been, but also in hopeful expectation of who you're shaping us to be. Let your love work in us so you can better work through us. We stand ready, ready to embrace all you have for our lives ready to do your will, ready to witness the wonders of your mighty hand, ready to share the redeeming love, the perfect grace, the life-changing salvation you have given us. So today, we lift up our voices in praise to the one who washes away our failures, who wipes away our fear and doubt, to the almighty God who makes all things new.
Happy New Year. Yeah, man. I haven't seen you guys for a long time. That wasn't, I wasn't going to say that dad joke, but it's kind of there if you need it. But um, this morning I want to cover a couple things before we get started. Number one, if you've never been to Connection online or in here, my name's Matt. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here at Connection. Uh, Happy New Year to you. Realize that when you came in the door or you're viewing us online, uh, you are potentially hearing a very dangerous message because the message of the cross and Jesus can change your life. has nothing to do with me. has everything to do with God. Uh, and he is, he is in the business of making all things new. Uh, I am a direct result of that. God has made me new. He has forgiven me. Uh, anybody in here, how many people again, how many people made it till midnight? I took a couple snoozes in between, but I made it to like 12 o'clock. I opened my eyes saw it was 1201 went back to went back to sleep we tried to get our girls to celebrate with london england you know about seven o'clock our time but they didn't want to do that so um they are we we celebrated and we had we had a good time it was just a just a rip roar and good time i was in my pajamas by about 8 30 so you know we were just you know having a blast going hard at it but uh anybody anybody not try just i'm going to sleep yeah okay we have those um we have some exciting things that are that are going on, but first I want to I want to I want to share with you something. There's a lot of emphasis put on a new year, a lot of a lot of goals. I, I I set goals for myself. I don't do I don't call them resolutions. I think goals has a with me it has more of a competitive thing. Like I wanna I wanna achieve it. It's something that I can work towards. Um, but I heard uh, on the radio out of the hundreds of millions of New Year's resolutions or goals, only 12% of those New Year's resolutions will be seen to fruition. It means 12%, so 12 out of 100, those, those goals will come, uh, those will, will come to, to happen. So if you want to lose weight or you want to exercise more or um, if you want to do different, different things, understand this. 2022 is over. And for some of you, it was a horrific year. For some of us, it was a fantastic year. Maybe it was a successful business year. Or you, you, you started dating somebody or you got married or you had a baby or you did this or whatever you did. But for the most part, there's probably not a whole lot of people in here that, say, that would say that 2022, everything about it was awesome. Because there's always things that happen. So when we, when we look at this, at, at this new year, I want to make sure that you understand for some of you, 2022 could have been the roughest year or the most difficult year of your entire life. And you're sitting in the same room where 2022 could have been the most prosperous or the most fun year somebody has ever been alive. You see, everything in our life is affected, has affected us differently. Maybe 2022 was absolutely awful. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you did some things that you're not proud of. Maybe you did a lot of different things. And I want you to hear me this morning. It doesn't matter how you answered the question on how your 2022 was. In spite of all things, good and bad, today, God is still good. He can't not be. He's the author of good. He's the author of love. He, he can't not be good. So when we look, when we look, uh, yesterday we actually, if you're if you're uh, if, if you know the situation, I just wanted to make it make it verbal to you so that you can know the situation. Uh, names are not important, but we have a, some people in our church that are heading down uh, to be with their family. Uh, we have a guy in our church that lost his uh, his dad yesterday, uh, so they're traveling out of state with their family. So you can lift them up in prayer. Names don't matter. God knows them. So, um, but I was talking to him last night. And it's very, it's very different the way that a follower of Jesus Christ talks about death. Uh, this person's dad was a, a, an awesome Christian guy, lived his life for God, and was saved, uh, has been saved for a long time. And they just, he was ready to go home. He was sick. And uh, I, said, I called him by name, and I said, you know, in spite of this morning, and, and God gave us these emotions, we're supposed to use them. Uh, but throughout that process, I was able to tell him, I said, you know what? Through all the tears and all of the different things, I said, I never got to I never got to meet your dad on this earth. 
And he kind of, and he kind of sort of chuckled and he said, "Yeah, I know. You guys would have hit it off. He's a gun guy, and I like guns." So uh, he said, "I know that you didn't get to meet him here, but because of Jesus, you get to worship with my dad forever." And there is something that this earth cannot give you that God can, and that's peace. Do we have emotions? Absolutely. Do we mourn? Yes. Do we hurt? Yes. But we have the hope and the peace that passes understanding. We can be comforted even if 2022 wasn't your year. I want you to understand that your past doesn't define you. It's a brand new year. It's a brand new start. And I'm going to tell you some things about me uh, that you may not know. Uh, I hope I don't embarrass myself too much, but maybe you had a goal of losing weight, getting in shape, or exercising more. Fantastic. What's your spiritual goal? We want to get more, we want to become more like Jesus. We, we want to have more, more intimate, quiet times with God, quality time with God. Do we want to, do we want to grow more in our prayer life? Do we want to trust God more? All of these things are fantastic. Um, and a lot of the times that we, we read the, I'm sorry, I have this trouble with my ear. I, I've had this sinus and all these things and all the time. So, um, do you want to read your Bible more? Do you want to grow in your prayer life? Um, do, do you want to get closer to Jesus? Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I play tug of war with God. Sometimes we fight. Sometimes we argue. Okay, I don't win any of these. I'm just telling you the, how, how real life this can be. But for the past two or three months, I've been, I've been, I've been in, a, in a tug of war. So if there's this great big long hallway, and, and I know the exact door on the end that God wants me to go down, right? I know where he wants me to go. However, there are many doors on each side of the hallway. Metaphorically, do you understand what I'm talking about? Okay, God says, I want you to go at the other end. Well, I've got a pocket full of keys. And I know that's where he wants me to go, but I need to check all the other doors before I get there to make sure that there's not something a little bit easier to go into. So not only do I check the door to see if they're locked, I use every single key and I multiple check. I mean, have you been here spiritually? You're, you're, you know where God wants you to go, but he says, listen, I need you to go here. I'm like, yeah, but God, but it's... So I've, I've, been, I've been talking with God over the last two or three months, and we've had this tug of war, and oftentimes I say, God, I, number one, I don't think that I'm, a, that I'm a super intelligent, I'm not a scholarly person, I'm a student of the Bible still learning still will till i die but it's in there's things that come in in my life with that god wants me to speak on there that are intimidating to me i know that god's my source of power i know that the holy spirit can speak through me i know all these things but it's still my humanistic side says this is a this is big and i said okay we have people in our church thank god we have people in our church that don't know who jesus is they come all the time we have people in our connect group that don't know who Jesus is. I don't know if you understand that, but this is where they should be. That's good. We're, we're introducing them to Jesus, and, and there's, there are people that are continually growing and becoming more mature in their faith, and they're stepping out, and they're giving more, and they're doing bigger things for God. And I kept having this conversation with God. I said, God, I, ooh, I really know what's on the other side of that door. I know what you want me to preach through. I know what you want me to start. I know how the, the last year was going to end. I knew about this, this psalm that I was going to speak on this morning. Um, and I just, I just said, God, I, I want to do, this is, this is the hard part. When we say, God, I want to do what you want me to do, that removes all control from you. Because he can show you, but then you have, still have the choice to do it or not. So I said, God... I would like to preach on something. I know that you can do anything you want with the Holy Spirit. I know that you can do all these things. I said, I want to do, I want to preach through something that can be grasped by even our young people, but is challenging enough for people that get intimate in, into, the, into the Bible and with their life mature-wise, but in their faith, that it challenges us. So next week, we'll be starting a new study on Sunday morning. And I've talked with God about this. And as much as I argued against this, this is what God wants us to do. And I've believed this because I've, because I've prayed about it. And God just opened this to me. 
but I have humanistic fear. You ever have fear? You let fear get in the way? God, what if people get bored? And I'm like, well, they get bored with me every Sunday, so what's the matter? Okay, that's, that's so, I said, what, what, if they, what, if they get, what if they get bored? And he said, what is their intent? I'm not talking about you. I don't talk to God about you. I pray for you, but I don't talk to God about you. My, my humanistic side said, what if they get bored? This is not going to be over in six weeks. This is, is going to be a very, very complex study. And I was just reminded how many times in the last month I have been going back to this same book and going back to this same book and going back to this same book and going back to the same book. He says, Matt, the world outside needs to know exactly who Jesus is and they need to meet him. Let's study this. Let's empower and grow together. Go out and affect the people with the gospel. So next Sunday, if you want to bring a notebook, if you want to bring a pen, um, we're going to be we're going to be starting in the Gospel of John. And I love that book. Uh, it's intimidating. It's daunting. If you've read it, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of well, this and this and this and this and you know has these things and you know the gospel and get saved in John three sixteen and yeah it also says love your neighbor as yourself anybody got that one mastered yet no okay <laughs> so so wh- wh- why 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 do I share that with you because we have a fresh start if you're if one of your goals is to know God better and in, in, in His Word if you're a guy and we're gonna have a girls group too uh, if more than one if needed if you're a guy and you want to go through a discipleship group. Um, Come and see me. I've already got a couple in there with me, and we're going to read the Bible through in a year. We're going to we're starting our fifth generation. I understand that uh, that people uh, say it's just it's a, it's a lot of time. I get it. We're also going to have the reading plans out here next week, so everybody can read through um, the Bible in a year if you can uh, try to. Um, so we're going to be going through we're going to be going through John. Now, why, 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 and how does this have anything to do with this morning? By starting John in one one, I'll give you I'll give you a spoiler alert. It starts with nothing. Bread. Clean can. In fact, the Bible tells us that uh, in it, everything was void and formless and dark. I don't even know what that means. Like, how do you describe something to somebody that's formless? Okay, but then God spoke. We're going to see God create. God the artist. So maybe this morning, you say, you know what? I need that restart this year. I just need a, I just need to, a day that defines today is the day. Look at the title of today's sermon. Today is that day. Now I started, I started on my weight loss goal before Christmas. Do you know why? Because I know me. So far, I've lost a little bit over 10 pounds, and I have not. Watch the, this is a big deal. I, have did, I did not eat one piece of my dad's fudge. My dad makes good fudge, and I didn't have a piece, not one. Um, but I'm, I'm trying. Now, why, why do I want to do that? Because I physically want, to, want you to hold me accountable so that I can show you in front of you. This is accountability. I want to I show you that, that I'm taking this very serious. I have started. I started on December 6th, and I am, I, am, I am doing this for me and because God said so. I think God calls us to do a lot of things that, that, that we don't want to do, but What's your what's what's your goal? Okay, I'm not asking for out out just out anything out loud. But if you turn to the middle part of your worship handout, you have a blank slate. There's three numbers there, and it says goals for 2023. These are your goals. This can be cut out. This can be taped to a mirror. This could be this be something that you can see every day. Now, why do I, why did I put that on there? Because I wanted to give you. The opportunity, maybe later, maybe during my sermon, God just speaks to you. I want to give you an opportunity to write those things down. And I know that we say this all the time. But what if this was a year where we said, God, I need your help. I'm doing this. I'm going to dive into the gospel of John next week. Brand new, fresh look at, at a gospel. This is, this is John that wrote Revelation. This is John, the beloved disciple. This is John that was at the cross. This is a big deal. You know what his message is? Love. Love. But it's so complex because there are people today that don't love us. We don't love them, right? Again, this issue's here. But are you 
you ready for that fresh start? Look at the first blank in your worship hand now. You can fill this out. Are you ready for a fresh start? Today's the day. Now listen, are, the, the, the big deal is, are you ready? Are you ready? You can go to Las Vegas, and before a big fight, what do they say? Let's get ready to rumble, right? By the way, I don't know if you know this, that guy has insurance on his voice. Let's get ready to rumble and everything, everything in all the, one of the casinos or wherever the fight just goes absolutely crazy. But the thing is, it says, let's get ready. The question here is, are you ready? Because you have to be ready if you want to change. Change can be a C-H-A-N-G-E, six-letter cuss word. We don't like change, right? We, we don't want, we don't, mm, 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 don't, let's don't, let's don't rock the boat. Are we ready for a fresh start? If you are, I pray that you ask God to do that today, right now. It's a, it's a, it's a monumental day. It's, it's New Year's Day. A little bit of personal information about me. Inside, I'm a nerd. Big time. So I'm getting ready to share with you some intimate details about my nerdiness. So like those three, like those three numbers and the three goals, it's empty, it's fresh. In fifth grade, I had a teacher, her name was Mrs. Ritchie, and Mrs. Ritchie taught us something um, that I'm, I feel accomplished when I talk to my high school players because I can not only write in cursive, I can also read it. Did you know these kids cannot do that? It's, it's, it's crazy. But in fifth grade, I had penmanship class. Now, I don't know if it was something to do with my competitive nature, but I won the penmanship award for my entire class. And it's followed me through my life. Even my, the guys that I meet with in D group, they, they tease me that I write like a girl. Okay, that I have, if it's everything is all nice and everything like that. I can't draw to save my life, but some, for some reason I can, I can write well and neat and it's legible. One of my favorite things in D group is to write journals, but I'm telling you, um, I'm also a pen snob. Is anybody else a pen snob? I am a horrific, horrific pen snob. Precise V5 RT in blue. You can ask Sarah. I can. Sh she can show you the documents from what I spend for my office supplies. It's always here. It always has been. And unless they make one with Jesus in it, it's going to be this one. Okay. The, it's it's ultra fine. It writes in my Bible. It doesn't bleed through the paper. Like I, there's multiple uses, but I really like blue. So, one of my favorite things to do. Maybe maybe you'll you can. Maybe like a first day of school when you get that brand new notebook and there's nothing written on it. And you just, and you just take that moment in. That I'm totally a nerd, okay, here. I'm just, but I'm like, and I begin to, to, to write my journals. But once, once that started, it's not fresh anymore. There's something significant to me about looking at snow. We're looking at the beginning of the year that God says that he, he forgives us and makes us whiter than snow. We get a new start to remind us that we can have a new start with Christ every day if we love, if we follow Him. We have all these different things, but once we start, we're, we begin that journey. Anybody like Lord of the Rings? Yeah, like three of us. Okay, cool. So he had to start. He had to leave. Frodo had to leave the Shire to accomplish the end of the journey. You have to start it. You have to. So. Maybe, maybe 22 has, seriously, maybe it, that year just kicked you around. We're not going to go back and glorify the bad things, but I tell you what, we can glorify what God has done. And those, remember those stones that we used to talk about, the Ebenezer stone, that we stack up? Those are going to come into play. So if you have your Bibles, look at verse uh, 1 in chapter 34 of Psalm. This psalm is written, people, people often tell me, if you're wanting to read the Bible through in a year, this is my suggestion. You ready? And for those of us that have or understand, you'll understand. Do not begin your read a Bible through in a year in Leviticus or First and Second Chronicles. Okay? Start with Genesis or start, excuse me, in the New Testament. Get something that will, that will, that will teach you. You can start in John if you like. But people tell me, they say, I can't believe that you read the Bible. It's boring. There's love in here. There's war in here. There's plot twists. There's talking donkeys. There's floating axe heads. There's the raising of the dead. There's the healing of disease. There's the parting of water. All kinds of stuff in here. We're going to 
see contextually, I want to explain in First Samuel 21, uh, I think it's uh, in the first part of verse, uh, chapter 21 in First Samuel, this is a psalm written by David, but it is as an account that he remembers back. So if you've read th this story in 1 Samuel, if you haven't, I'll let you go back and just, and just read it. But da David was fearing for his life. So he was trying to do, when you're desperate, you'll do anything, right? Listen, we didn't, ha we didn't, ha we didn't know where Minnie Mouse was one night. Lydia didn't sleep without Minnie Mouse. I called fire down from heaven. I did. God, please, in the name of Jesus and stuff, I need to find this mini mouse. We're, when, we're, when we're desperate, we do these, these things. The, the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel that to, to, to get release, David, we're talking about King David. David acted like he was mentally insane. And the Bible tells us that he even he drooled down his beard. It's weird. It's, why would you do that? Because he was very fearful of his life. Now, I want you to show you something. David writes this, but it's out of those situations that he writes this, this psalm. And he's saying, the reason I can go forward is because I can remember backwards what God has done for me. And that helps me keep going. In verse 1, he says, I will praise the Lord. Now, here's the deal. I don't think that David wrote Psalm 34 like this. Was anybody at Times Square Mall last night going, oh, 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 oh good, all right, yeah, yeah, give me, let's go home. No, no, he's remembering, and out of the remembrance of, do you remember how God is, how good God has been to you? What about the relationship that you're in now, as opposed to the one that you used to be in? What about the 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 freedom of addiction that you are now experiencing that you used to not have? Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you wake up bright-eyed instead of glossed over. See, God, God has brought us through. My, my sister, my sister we, we have this thing. We have these stones that somebody says, like, you know, it looks formidable. It looks, it, it looks too big to pray for. My sister had her appendix rupture, and her body was septic during COVID with no visitor. She was misdiagnosed. They let me in because I was, I was honest with them. I said, I am her pastor. I'm also her brother. God, God did a miracle. The lady I was talking to was her nurse the night before. I got to come in. Since I left the hospital, a couple things clicked with me that I was the only other non-nurse in the entire hospital. And I looked at the nurse and I said, did you let me in because you don't know if she's going to make it? And she said, yes. And me, along with several of you, began to pray that God would heal her body. And I, w when, whenever, whenever Jennifer came out of the hospital, we didn't say, hey, glad you're home. You're not going to sit at Game 7 of the World Series if you're a Cardinals fan and watch them win the World Series, sit, sitting down and go, bravo, boys. You're not going to do that. Okay, th why? Because I've been to a game like that, and it's insanely loud. So David's like, yes, I will praise the Lord at all times. What does all times mean? If you underline in your Bible, that means all times. All times. When everything's going good, yep, when you get what you want for Christmas, even that's fine. If it's going really bad, yes, when, you're, when you lose a loved one. I listened to my friend say last night that even though uh, earthly I don't have my dad anymore I am so thankful for Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for us that we can have salvation it doesn't get any more difficult than right then he says I will praise the Lord at all times I will constantly speak his praises now why do we do this why do we need to do that because the world doesn't hear it they need to hear what God has done for you because they can argue with the tangible evidence. I can't, I can't put God in front of them. Famous quote from, from, from Billy Graham is, he was, he was asked a question by a non-believer, and they said, Billy Graham, you've devoted your entire life to going all over the globe and, and, and helping give the gospel message to millions of people that have accepted Christ. How can you believe in so something so wholeheartedly, but you've never seen it? And he said, as Barry 
very smart people do. They answered, he answered their question with a question, and he said, can you see the wind? They said, yeah, you see leaves blowing around. He goes, no, 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 no. You can see the effects of the wind, but you cannot see the wind. But yet you believe it's there because you can feel his presence. I have seen the evidence in my life of God's presence. That's why I wholeheartedly believe in it. He will constantly, Albert Pujols, probably one of the greatest hitters of my entire lifetime. He, they give an interview with him. He's going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. They get an interview with him after the game. The very first thing he says, I want to give all the credit to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Millionaire. Multiple times. Has no wants in life. Helps people all the time. Has a special hospital for kids and treatment centers for, for kids with disabilities. He could buy his own island. He says, no, I don't do anything that I do without God's help. And I wonder if that's something that we need to work on. Is that something that needs to be one of our goals? If we give God the credit. Look at verse 2. He sa David says this, I will bo boast only, if you underline, only. I will boast only in the Lord. David was a military powerhouse. He led, he led the Israelites' armies, conquered countries, and they, they, they killed because God told them to, because these people were doing bad things. He, he led armies on humongous, monumental wins of, of battle. He was famous. He was, gonna, he was then king. But what we don't know is, is, or we do know, but we don't concentrate on it, that David himself was physically hunted by the king. He was physically hunted by King Saul. Saul wanted to kill him. Now, if you think the Bible is boring, one day, David was hiding from Saul in a cave, and he was hiding in the very back. If you remember this story, you remember this story. The Bible's not boring, okay? David was hiding back here in the back of the cave with his men, and the Bible tells us that Saul came in, and he used the restroom in, in the cave. Now, if you, I don't know if you understand that, that point of that. When you do that, as, which everybody does, you're exceptionally vulnerable. And David could have killed Saul, yet he let, he let Saul get out of the cave. Then he came out of the cave and said, Hey, Saul, hey, king, I could have killed you, but I didn't. He said, I didn't want to kill the one that God anointed to be king. The Bible's not boring. David has all these things, but Saul, anyway, Saul did not kill him that day. And, and David, again, he said, I will only boast in the Lord. This, is, this guy that writes these words is the same guy that commits adultery. It's the same guy that God says is a man after his own heart. How do we see, how do we see these ups and downs of, man, he, he, he sinned greatly and he loved greatly, and how, how does this all balance out? Have you ever messed up? Let me ask you that question first. Have you ever messed up? And number two, if you've ever messed up, are you thankful for God's grace? All right, now we move on, right? It's an, exa it's ex in his example of that David was up and down. P Paul, as, as Saul, killed Christians, and he's the greatest missionary in the entire world has ever known. And David said, listen, I will boast only in the Lord. It was only God that helped me survive Saul. It was only God that helped me that helped me get out of the things that, that I was in. It wasn't only two times that David's life was in danger. By the way, with the, with the sin of adultery, if you if you don't know, I don't want to spoil anything for you, but there are con there were consequences for his sin. Drastic. See, that's that's why learning more about God and and his, and his word is very important because it gives us spiritual ammunition. I can reach back and say, "Yes, I've seen God heal my sister." Yes, I've seen, I've seen God. I've been, I've been, I had my head when I told you about this, when I pulled the basketball rim down on my head, but I laid down in the back seat and my mom had my head like this and she was putting, putting pressure on my head so it wouldn't bleed. And we went to, from Albion to Mount Carmel, which is technically about 15 miles. My dad made it about eight minutes, I think. I don't know how fast that car was going, but my dad was, or my mom was holding my head and I heard my mom pray words that I should have probably never heard or pray. Out of desperation. But my mom, even in desperation, knew where her hope comes from. And she said, God, don't let him die. I heard that from my mom. I look 
looked at my mom. I never lost consciousness. I looked at my mom and I said, Mom, if I do, realize that I'm okay. I was scared, probably in shock. We got to the, we got to the hospital. They, they patched me up. They sewed me up. And, I mean, all the way to the skull. The muscles all in my face had to be re-sewn together. I've always struggled with that. <laughs> so, but my, they, they, they put me together, they put me all together, and they, they fixed a, a, a great big goose egg that I had on my head. And after I got all bandaged up, the doctor came in and he said, I have, n-, I heard him talk to my mom. I said, he goes, I have no idea how he's still here. We found three different cracks in his skull. He's got 39 stitches in his, in his head. We sewed up muscles that should never be a part. And what do I do with that now? That's a stone. Until until God is finished with you, understand that the Bible tells us that until you've accomplished what God wants you to accomplish on this earth, while you're still breathing oxygen, you have a job to do. So why go through John starting next Sunday? So we can equip an army. Young kids to older adults, we're going to equip an army. I'm not going to. We're just going to go together. And we're going to equip each other and keep building each other up so we can boast about what God has done. One day, we're going to have a dedication for a gym. Oh, Pastor Matt, you led us so good in that. No, we're going to boast about God, about how he provided, about how he took care of us, about how the miracles that he brought in just in in, in that way. Let all who uh, are helpless take heart. So what we, we talk about God because when you boast about God, there are people around you that you don't know that don't have any hope. And when you start talking about hope around people that don't have any hope, do you know what they do? They listen. They do. I will boast only in the Lord that all who are helpless take heart. We, we tell people about Christ, not for our gain. We boast about God to say, listen, you find a friend that has this situation, it's, listen, I know what it's like. We have people in our church, including me and my wife. They have had they had trouble having kids. They had things happen. We lost a baby. There are people in our church that have done the same thing. Listen, we didn't think things were possible. I have a stone for that too. I have two of them. Emma and Lydia. When God says he can do whatever he wants to do, he's not joking. He can. So I have somebody that comes to me. Actually, there's somebody in my life right now that called me two mornings ago at about 6.45. And he said, hey, um, I've been praying for them. He said, my, they're not from around here, so you don't have to guess who it is. But me and my wife have been trying to have our second baby. And, 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 and we're just getting really, 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 really anxious. And we don't, know, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to quit trying. And we don't want to do this and this and this. Then he asked me this question. What advice do you have? The only advice that I can give you is to trust him. In timing and patience, with child, without child, you have to trust him. And when he answers you, you give him the glory for it. It has nothing to do with you. In verse 3, he continues on with that. He says, come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. If you underline in your Bible, underline or circle the word together. So cool. This is my favorite part. You know what together means? worship well that's because you play in the band and not no 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 no. Mm -mm. connect group d group church worship sermon some of you some of you by saying hi to somebody in the lobby preached a louder sermon than i could ever preach today you just said hi to somebody that's helpless or hopeless you said hi to them it's there it's more than what i'm saying let us exalt his name together it's, I'm not going to come out to the gym in a couple years or whenever we get it built. I'm not going to come and wrap a great, big, a great big ribbon around the gym and come out here by myself all secretively on Facebook Live and go, ha, snip. That's crazy. Because I didn't do it by myself. We collectively exalt his name together. I know that we have people that are gone, people that are were at 9 o'clock, and I know that there are not as many people that are normally here. I wish you could have heard yourself sing. You know what it's like to go to church camp if you come down and visit us to go into worship. Those kids rock. 
And you just hear this. You can hear it from outside. You can lock all the doors, shut all the windows, and if you're outside, you can physically hear the anthems that are being sung by these kids. Exalting his name together is more powerful than doing it by yourself. The Bible didn't create us to be alone. We need each other. Why am I going to do the weight loss thing in, in, in quote unquote, in front of you? Because I want to show you what it means to be accountable and to do it together. I'm excited. Mary found no carb tortillas. Boom, boom. Tacos. I could live on tacos. Anybody? You live on tacos? All of them, all day. Okay? But look at verse 4 with me. David says this. He said, I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. There are people in our church that don't have the fear that they used to have. See, Satan wants to keep you in your fears. He wants to keep you in that closet. David is just giving another explanation. He said, listen, I used to be in a closet. I used to be all dark. It used to be bad. I used to suffer from this. I mean, you can put all, anything you want there. Depression. I, I was scared about preaching through the gospel of John. I'm talking about Jesus, and it's intimidating to me. You know why? Because I'm human. Because I mess up. Because I'm afraid I'm going to get something wrong. It's a big deal. I, have to, I don't know if you understand this. I have to answer for that. I'm not, I'm not having a pity party here. It's, it's what God chose for me to do. But it's, it's, it's hard because we see those things and we're like, oh, uh, I don't know. You see the little kid that just moved up from coach pitch to kid pitch in baseball? And they, they, and they aren't like just really amped up about being there. And this kid is like one of the oldest in the, in the division. And your kid is like the youngest. And this is how they get into the batter's box. They're terrified, aren't they? I remember when I moved when I moved up when I moved up into summer baseball, and we had a, a guy that was throwing pretty hard. And my mom goes, "Oh my gosh, he's going to get hurt." I'll never forget that. I'm like, "Mom, there's other guys around here." Shh, be quiet. There's other guys. He freed us from all our all his fears. David said, "Listen, I used to be fearful from what from from all the things that bothered me." In verse five says. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. Oh, do you have these people in your in your life? They're like literally happy all the time, and it makes you sick to your stomach. I'm like, how in the world are you always happy? Right? Some of you think that's me. Okay. But here's here's the thing. Joy is different from happiness. God didn't say you're going to get happiness. He said you will radiate with joy. No shadow of shame shall darken their faces. Do you physically know some of these people spiritually? It's like when they wake up in the morning, they high-five Jesus himself. They're just, hey, dude, your house just burnt. Isn't God good? It's just weird, okay? It's weird because it's not normal on this, on this earth. This is, this is what it means. For too long, the, quote, the, the capital C church has walked around absolutely pathetic and boring. You walk around... We walk around, the, the, the church, we walk around like we're spiritual Eeyores. Do you know what Eeyore does? You have the life-saving eternal payment for your sin inside of you. world doesn't want to follow that instead the world looks on social media for the appealing that's what they want you need to be a tigger not annoying not bouncing all the time but come on let me tell you what god has done for me let me show you what god did for me i changed we were going hunting or something and i had a i, had, I was getting ready to put on some camouflage and my 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 buddy was there and I took off my shirt, and he said, dude, your arm looks rocking. I had a big scar from where I had surgery. I said, yeah, it's pretty sore. All my, my nerves are starting to go back together, and my back part of my arm it hurts. And I'm not having a pity party. Just, that it's just what it is. And he goes, man, it's a wicked scar. I said, yeah. He says, well, you know, he's joking with me. He's my best friend. He goes, well, we're not going to get in any beauty contest, so that really doesn't matter. But he 
said, you can have that reminder for a long time. I said, isn't it awesome? He goes, what? He says, you got a scar five inches long on the side of your arm. He goes, the only way you can cover that up is like with a face tattoo. He goes, what are you, you going to do? I said, I said I'm not going to cover it up. I said, to you, it's something negative. To me, I see that God healed my body of cancer. There's a difference. There's a difference in our attitude. No shadow or shame shall darken their faces. Man, God has always provided everything that I've needed. And I'm not bragging, I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just I'm telling you, if you don't know the answer to that question, that's the answer to the question. My God will supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. Period. End of story. It's in the Bible. We have to know the Bible. In verse 6, he says this. In my desperation. Oh, that's often the only time that we pray, isn't it? I'm, I'm on the boat with you. I get it. My mom saw a very, very bleak outlook for her son. My sister's appendix ruptured inside, making causing her body to become septic. And we thought we were going to lose her. When we, when we have these desperation things, when, when David was in the cave and he couldn't took Saul's life and he didn't, when, when he appeared to be insane so they would let him go, all these different times he was hunted, he said, listen, when it got to the desperating point or desperation point, I prayed. And do you want some good news that if you follow Jesus Christ, whenever you utter words with your mouth or you do them physically, mentally, without saying anything, God hears you. He's concerned about you. He wants to talk to you. Every single day, he sets this out. He has this table, and he's sitting here. And we're gonna, there's a verse that talks about this. He sits down, and there's this, there's this wonderful metaphorical meal here. And God says, I want you to sit down. Let's do this together. It's his word. Let's do it together. The Great Commission. Missio de Geo is actually the term. <clears throat> See, I told you I'd sound smart. Anyway. We put the word, God put the word co in front of mission, meaning he wants us to go along with him. The fact that you and I get to be involved in the Great Commission blows my mind and I'll never understand it. Why does God want to choose me to help him? Do you know yourself? Why on earth? It's like, it, it just makes no sense. But God says, I want you to come to this table. I want to talk with you. Every day I want to talk with you. David here says, In my desperation I prayed, and the Lord, listen, he saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. David's speaking from, his, from the protection that God has given him. Spiritually, you have no idea what goes on in the spiritual realm around us. You have no clue. I can't explain it either, but we're, we're told some very interesting things. By the way, the translated word for angel, we, we, we often, people... And it's, it's not being dumb, it's being ignorant of the fact that it means you just don't know, okay? I'm not calling anybody dumb, but people say, I have a guardian angel watching out for me. That's absolutely, totally false. That word angel in the New Testament is plural. How about that? Give angel protection. If we could give people goggles that saw the spiritual realm of things, there wouldn't be a lost person in the world. There's a, there's a war going on against your family against your kids, against you. In verse 8, he says this. This is one of my favorite verses of Scripture ever. I know that I say that a lot, but this is really wonderful. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in Him. Taste and see. This metaphorical, watch this. This is not, this is not a, hey, oh, all right. God's like chocolate flavored. Okay, He's not that. It's not, it's not physical. God says, sit down with me. Eat with me. Get to know me more in 2023. I want, to, I want to know you. God already knows you intimately. It's our job to know him intimately. He knows the numbers or lack of numbers of hairs on our head. If he knows that, he knows all the details about you. It's our job to get closer to him. So when he says taste and see, what he's saying is, I'm inviting you to come to my table so that we can talk about how stuff's going. It's the most beautiful thing, and it's the most absurd offer that we have ever seen, other than Jesus. He says, come and sit with me. Come to the table. Eat. Hang out with me. The hard part is, at this meal, 
God says, okay, Matt, what do we need to work on? Not one time have I ever been to the table and God says, you are doing so good. <laughs> Not once. It, it, it's, it's that thing, we have, to get, we have to get closer, we have to get intimate. In verse 9 and 10, he says, Fear the Lord, you, uh, you his godly people, for those who fear him will have all they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hun- hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Reverence is not a bad thing. God doesn't want us to be like, like scared, scared, like we think scared. Reverent is the same as fear. And reverent fear is, is, is good. We have to keep in mind this. Who is God to us spiritually? He's our Father. What, is, what, what, what does the Bible tell us that a, a human father and mother should do? Discipline. Um, I don't think I'm going to do that. Okay, then I can show you in Scripture what rewards you're going to reap out of that. They're not rewards. They're consequences. So I'm 16, 17 years old in Missouri. I don't do what I'm supposed to do. Shocker. I don't know. You all are perfect on that end. So anyway, I, I would do something, and my dad would say, listen, I'm like, no, I don't know. Mm-mm, no. Mm-mm. I'd rather not give you my car keys. I'd rather not do that. I was 16 or 17 years old. I literally tried to talk my dad back into spanking me. I said, hey, just get this over with. Just here. Just hit me. Something. I just don't, just don't take my keys. Do you know why he took my keys? Same way, same reason you take your kid's phone. It gets their attention rather quick. And we do that as, as, because we're mean. No, God doesn't do it because he's mean. He says, listen, I want you to understand that there, you need to understand why I want you to do this. I may not even, I may not know this side of heaven, why I'm supposed to preach through the, all the reasons why I'm supposed to preach through John. I have no clue. Maybe it's for me. I don't know. Why, am I, why did I preach on Psalm 34 this morning? I may never know with you. I know why for me. Because you get, you get hungry. Matt, do you know why you get hungry? Because I'm on keto? Because <laughs> I can't eat anything that tastes has any flavor? No, I'm kidding. No, no, he says, listen, you get hungry because you don't sit down at my table. We have to take it serious. 2023, God says this. For me, some of my goals to be open and honest with you, I want to be a better pastor. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better dad. I want to give more than I've ever given before. That's one of me and Mary's big time goals. We we increase what we give away every year. Well, our pastor's so holy. No, no. I want to show you examples of why. Because I want to make heaven crowded. Has nothing to do with me. I want to I want to show hungry people spiritually where the food's at. Listen, if you're spiritually hungry and you never met Jesus, come back next week and let's talk about John. We're going to show you how powerful God is. The Godhead, the Trinity. He says, listen, you're hungry, Matt, because you don't sit down. Now, how do we do this? You could have eaten four. Raise your hand if you're with me. You could go two or three different places for Thanksgiving, and you could have eaten at every single one of them. And the last place that you're going to go, in my opinion, or my, my place, was Grandma Rose's house. It didn't matter if I had eaten seven times that day. If my grandma fixed me a plate, what did she expect me to do? Thus I'm on a diet. Okay, get it? Yeah, she said, no, sit down, honey, honey. Sit down. I'm like, great. I've had, you know, I've had sweet corn, I've had roast ham, turkey, deer. I've had all, we, we have all kinds of things to eat. And I've come to my grandma's house. Oh, honey. I can just warm you up some of those mashed potatoes. Like, Grandma, I could not fizz. Eat anything else. Yet, it's a miracle again. Every time I went to her house, I ate it all. Every time. I think she forced me. But it, we, with God, you can't get full. You, you can get full and your cup metaphorically flows over. Okay, yes. But you, you, can't, you can't get too much. And I think what we need is we need to understand that we need what God wants for us. Look at the last blank. We'll be done with this one. This is, this is very important, and this is much deeper than it looks. 
we need to desire. What does that mean? Mean want? No. It means yearn to do. You have if you if you have a desire to play uh, past high school in sports, for the majority of people that doesn't just happen. You have to have a desire, something you're going to work for. I love it also because it's not instant. I also don't like it because of that same way. It takes patience. It takes hard work. What God, you have to desire what God desires. Where do we find that? Psalm 37, 4. It says, if we delight ourselves in, in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. Oh, cool. Brand new 614 Taylor guitar. No. I don't know. I don't know. When we, when we are so steadfast after God, our heart will match his. I get asked all the time by my dad and people that I'm, that, you know, I'm 42 and they're like, hey, you could have been finishing a 20, had God been so gracious, you could have been finished a 20 year career and you could be like loaded millions of dollars if you played baseball. I looked at them and I said, I have no desire to have ever lived that lifestyle. Used to, absolutely, grew up six years old, wanted to play for the St. Louis Cardinals. I was going to take Ozzie Smith's job. <laughs> yeah, right. God changes our heart. He changes our appetite. Had I done that, I would have never got to meet you. I mean, if that's not a big deal to you, it's a huge deal to me. I've seen God change your life. I've seen people in this room in the last five years give their life to Jesus Christ and be baptized. Forever, brothers and sisters. There's no amount of doubles or hits or home runs or money that could ever even come close to that. But he says that we have to desire what God desires. He says we must be willing, there's that word, to follow his guidance. Does anybody, if you want to be really honest this morning, is it really difficult for you sometimes to follow? Anyone? Would you, who, who would rather lead? Nobody's brave. <laughs> if you're going to go on a road trip, I'll make this easy. If you're going to go on a road trip, how many people want to drive? I want to be in charge. Right? It's difficult for us because we have to choose to follow. Following does not come natural for us. It doesn't. Why? We were born selfish. We want it our way. Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. That's what he couldn't have sang a more prideful song in the history of the world. But that's the way we are. We're built that way. He says, You must be we must be willing to follow his guidance. And I don't know what I don't know what goals you're going to write down. I don't know where you're going to put them. Put them on your mirror. Put them somewhere you're going to see every day. I got a feeling 2023, God's going to blow us away. I'm being for real. You know why? Because we're going to concentrate on doing everything together. Connect groups, D groups, worship. Man, come into church expecting God to move. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be funny if I came to you in like the month of May and said, hey, by the way, we're just waiting on a company to come and give us a couple quotes because somebody wrote a check for the building. He can. He may not. He might be about to. I don't know. But he can. My desire is not for a gym. My desire is to be desiring what God wants me to do. And when we do that, Maybe this is the year we see 50 people get saved. Can you imagine? I've been a part of that one time. It's pretty amazing. We have to desire what God wants us to desire for us. If we intentionally go to that door. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much. For Jesus, we thank you so much, God, of what you've given us in the Bible to teach us. God, we pray as... As we write down these goals that, God, we might be held accountable not only by you, God, but by, by other people that we trust and we can, we can grow towards you. God, may our, may our time and our, our, uh, our focus be put more on you this year. May we take a very serious intent on getting closer and to intimately know you better and more. May we come to the table more often and more quality time. God, help us break our heart for what breaks yours. Help us desire what you want for us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the hope that we have through him. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.